Ready. We are doing engineering management, and it is Monday, and we are having our regular engineering management lecture. All right. So last time I was looking at, we started with a lecture number three of the management information and innovation series. Still haven't gotten through this, but we're going to start flying through pr pretty soon here because uh, we're going to hit a lot of stuff that uh, we've already covered. So there's a little bit of an overlap between all the different lecture sets. So. And then uh, it also gives you different and multiple sources of reference and information, so you can work for it. So anyway, managing the, we stopped here at the, from what I remember, we stopped around this point here, which is the second segue into describing and formulating the present business case for information systems. And so making a case for implementation, and now this is information systems, but it's really technology systems, processes, and engineering practices in general. Um, so it goes above and beyond the IS concept. This lecture set is written, actually most of these are written, all talking about information systems. But if you think about it, that's the driving factor, information systems for most of American businesses these days. And it's all about the systems. And they're all information oriented. So you can't really you can't really say it's not the topic, but at the same token, you can say, well, it's more than just information systems is the point I'm trying to make. So identifying the benefits that are proposed uh, that will bring an organization either automating benefits, information benefits, or strategic benefits, and then looking at the different gains. So automating benefits would be productivity gains. All right, so we're going to invest in technology. You're the engineering manager, and you're going to invest in technology or information systems to make an improvement on the organization. And so the big question is, going back to this slide here, is you know, what area of improvement are we looking at? We could do it using Porter's model and say, well, we want to have more competition. We want to be the price leader. We want to be the... You know, the, we want the most features. We want this, we want that, in terms of the strategy from a marketing perspective. Or you can take the benefits from information strategic and automating, and productivity gains are probably one of the most interesting to look at. So it's easy to identify the costs with developing a system. You know how much it's going to cost. You know how much it's going to put it in. But then identifying the productivity gains could be the tricky part. So there's limitations to productivity gains with development and information systems. The limitations are um, generally geared towards, um, you know, at, at what point does productivity stop improving? It's kind of like if you think about your own personal life and the ele personal electronics that you actually purchase and use as a consumer. At one point, after you have an iPod or after you have a, a tablet or you have, you know, a certain set of technology, your productivity is not going to increase any further. In fact, if anything, it might even go down. It might even make your make your life more complicated or even slower um, than if you didn't have all those gadgets and all those things to organize yourself in your life. Well, a company has the same problem. We can automate to a certain point, and we can increase productivity to a certain point, and then at one point we're not going to see any more productivity gain. So then a company has got to decide, and usually it's the manager who needs to decide, let's stop investing in this are let's not try to improve this any further, we're okay. It's kind of like, um, well, actually, it's sort of like anything in terms of cost-benefit analysis, if you think about it. If there's no benefit, you're not going to get, you're not going to earn anything from it, then for the long time, you might be thinking, well, there's no benefit. Does it outweigh the cost? No, it's not going to outweigh the cost. So why isn't productivity increased at the rate that information systems investments are increased? which is another phenomenon that occurs. As an example, hello, we uh, put a lot of money into the information systems technology. We buy everybody an iPad. We get them all on the latest operating system. We provide them all these tools so they can do a better job, and then they don't do a better job. <laughs> so usually you call that a poor investment, actually. Or you're a college student, and you buy the best and the most fastest computer, yada yada, but it still doesn't help you at all, and you still end up failing all of your classes or whatever. Well, the problem with that is that you've applied it in the wrong area. So just buying technology, buying information systems, putting in systems themselves don't necessarily lead to productivity gain or lead to anything profitable. So sometimes investments into these systems are bad, bad investments. And then you think, well, that company 
they invested that and they got a productivity gain or they got a cost gain or so, something they, they they somehow benefited from it but we're not benefiting from it so it's the company by company so productivity paradox and here we go in terms of this paradox if we were to describe it we'd say that information systems may be used in unintended ways so actually this happened this is uh, pretty true to life in fact it's still happening and the companies are realizing, do we need to give all these people internet access or unlimited access? And the answer is no, um, because they might not be using it for the intended purpose. So we give, uh, we say we want to increase the productivity of our sales team. Let's give them all cell phones. That would actually decrease their productivity. It's better not to give them a cell phone <laughs> because you think, well, that's going to give them, you know, better connectivity with their, with the people that they're talking with, yada, yada. Now, at the same time, you get like that paradox. It says, you know, is it worth the extra stuff the employee is going to be doing with the phone? So what ended up happening a while ago, everybody got phones. And then companies went, let's just take all these phones away. Only people who need the phones are getting the phones. Same thing happening with computers. Give everybody a notebook. Why are we giving everybody a notebook? Why are we giving anybody Internet access? Do they need Internet access to perform their job and what they're doing at the company? Maybe not, depending upon what kind of job they're doing. They might not necessarily need it. So we create this paradox where we don't turn the technology into toys and just do it because everybody else is doing it. Instead, we want to limit the technology to essentially create more, more productivity. So a lot of, um, well, banks have done this already because of security issues. You can't take a cell phone into a bank. Your bank teller, you can't work with a cell phone. You can't even have it in your pocket. You've got to leave it in a locker. Why? Because they don't want you breaching the security of your customers. And none of those teller machines have the internet on it. You can't surf the internet, go out to Facebook, go in. And it's not for productivity purposes, it's for security. It's a private inner exchange between the banks. We don't want all this garbage traffic going through it, hoaxes, viruses, all this other stuff, uh, worms and stuff. It's, it's too much of an exposure to put it on the internet, but it can still be computerized and it can still be networked, but it's inside of their own banking network, not part of the open internet. So we're not going to put the internet, we're not going to put it in the branch at all, actually, because it's just too much of a security risk. Well, retail companies, they should seriously take all the cell phones away from all of the employees. And you say, well, that's kind of harsh. So it's not your right when you're working on a job to be text messaging constantly because the employee's not helping a customer. Well, that's kind of one train of thought for productivity and effectiveness, but the other train of thought is what about, again, well, what about, you know, conflict of interest? What about security problems? What about, you know, then you think about it and go, well, it's more than just lack of productivity. It's policy. Um, and the, the way that a, somebody's doing their job, I mean, they may actually be more effective if they weren't so distracted by so many things. That's why you're not normally allowed to play video games in the middle of your job or something. I mean, you think it would be common sense, but you give people the technology and it doesn't turn into common sense anymore. I said, well, you gave me, you gave me access. I'm going to be using it all day. <laughs> it's like, well, that's kind of wrong thinking. So the benefits are difficult to quantify. Wrong things measured, maybe. Efficiency versus effectiveness actually is a good point. In fact, that's how you get education and the, the bringing in the internet into grade school. You measure test scores and they're down. In fact, we've gone down. Although they, they would argue, most teachers that are hip on technology in the classroom would argue and say, oh, the students are doing much better. Look, they're almost doing calculus. Yeah, thanks to Google or <laughs> thanks to, you know, thanks to the software that they're using to do that. It's not in their head. They have no, absolutely no idea what they're doing take the technology away from them, hand them a test and see how they perform. They can't even answer the first question. So, and then you're thinking, well then, you know, computers are everywhere. Do we need, to, then the, the whole school of thought is other people would come back and say, well, all right, but computers are everywhere. Do people really need to learn math right now? You know, how many calculators are out there? But, you know, the old school, if actually there was a while when people said, ah, oh, you don't need to teach math skills anymore. Nobody needs to take math anymore. Okay, calculator does it. And then nobody needs to write anymore either. We got writing machines that do that. And then what are we working for computers? So I don't know. I, I'm on the other side of the fence and I say, well, just because we have a calculator, we still have to know how to do basic math. And we still have to be able to write a sentence to save our life, you know, or something. Hello. 
but uh, you can argue it one way or the other. The bottom line, it's the strategy of the company that matters in terms of what their objective is. Um, some employees or employers, excuse me, um, offer benefits to employees like cell phones and computers and things, and it's more of a perk so that they do their job. And then what ends up happening is you've got this case, um, it's kind of like the, um, oh, it was the Veterans Administration, actually, and it was about, oh, it was a case, I think the case was called The Missing Laptop, and it was about 2005 when the Veterans Administration had this high-profile legal case where they gave uh, employees working at the Veterans Administration, they gave them notebook computers to encourage them to work at home, but they weren't paying for the homework, which is what you guys, some of you guys actually do this. They give The company gives you a notebook, they give you all this stuff, and you're at home watching TV thinking about the company work, and you have the resources in front of you, and you're doing company work, but you're not getting paid for it. You know, you're, you're not, it's actually... So they're getting you to work more hours, essentially. So that's one psychology of it. That's one benefit for the company. But in the case of Veterans Administration, what the guy did was he uh, was taking work home for the weekend, under working under that same philosophy, right? So he loaded a bunch of veterans information on this notebook, he loads it up with all this proprietary stuff from the Veterans Administration so he can do his job. And it was like health benefits or something. I can't remember what he was doing. But he loaded about, you know, I don't know, a couple million Veterans information, personal information, uh, their address, the symptoms that they had, their medical history, their social security numbers, everything was a dump from this database. And he stuck it on the laptop. He goes home, stops by the grocery store on the way home, and the laptop gets stolen. So the guy goes into work Monday morning and he gets fired. He's like, oh, he lost the company equipment. And the employer goes, well, you know, well, we don't have a policy. In fact, you guys were encouraging me to take work home. I told you when I was leaving on Friday I was going to go home for the weekend. I'm going to load this on my notebook so I can finish this up over the weekend. Why are you firing me? You know. And then, and it launched too short. It's the company who didn't have a policy, who made it kind of like practice, who didn't have a policy for not taking equipment home. In fact, they were completely against. That's why they gave them the equipment. So anyway, he sued for long, wrongful termination and won because you know, that he wasn't doing anything wrong. So they fired the guys, the, the, the boss who fired him. And then he sued for wrongful termination and won. And then the case took about five years to settle all the different parts. So the boss sued and won. And they got like ten times, I don't know, they got a better settlement than if they had been working. Each one of the veterans, about two millions of them, got ten thousand, no, excuse me, yeah, about ten to fifteen thousand dollars each for their breach of security because they did a class action lawsuit sued the Veterans Administration and won <laughs> because all of their equipment, all of their information was put on this notebook. Case was settled about five years. A couple more years after that they actually recovered the notebook. They found it actually. They Actually they found the hard drive that was in the notebook. They turned on the hard drive and they realized it had never even been accessed. Whoever stole the notebook never even opened it up and used it. It never it never even got so there was no problem any there was no security breach. There was nothing in the long run. But the government paid out a lot of money and then they realized, well maybe we should have policies. So as a general rule, people that follow that line of thinking aren't going to bring in a personal computer from home into the office. You're not going to take a personal office computer home with you. And why are you doing work on the weekends? That's absurd. You know, why are you taking stuff out of the office? Don't take anything home with you. Don't use your personal devices at work. Don't use your work devices at home. Create that, that, that separation there. Keep the security going on so that when you're working, you're working, and when you're not working, you're not working. How many people are really doing that now? Maybe 1% of the population? You say that to people, they look at you and go, well, that's an interesting concept. That's the legal system, however. The law doesn't want you to bring work home for you, with you. And it doesn't want you to bring stuff to the office either because you're causing a security issue. You're, causing a, you're, you're, you're bringing in outside stuff into the company that doesn't belong in the company. Does your personal life belong at work? No. Does your work life belong in your personal No. You know, there should be some sort of separation. And if you're not being paid for it, then you don't you know, necessarily need to worry about that. So companies then had to get around that and say, well, okay, we want you to be on call. 
then you, we pay you to be on call. We want you to check your email constantly, then here's the computer to check your email constantly, and here's the cell phone to use, and here's the... So companies can provide that. But then you also have these loose interpretations of what's giving a productivity gain and what's not. And then is it worth paying you to be on call for one person who's going to call over the weekend? Sometimes it is. if It's a really big customer or something. So Difficult, going back down to here, benefits are difficult to quantify. Wrong things measured, efficiency versus effectiveness. Example, ATM, strategic necess necessity at this point. Um, actually, ATM machines in general are kind of funny. They made them originally, which is, then they put them at the, they made them originally so they wouldn't have to have the banks. And then they realized that people aren't going to use the ATM instead of the bank. And then they stuffed them at the bank location. <laughs> So people would rather go into the bank. And then they gave incentives to use the ATMs. And then they charged you fees to use the ATM. So people then stopped using it. And you think about it, it's like, well, that was one technology that banks put in to make your life more convenient, to, to make them not have to hire as many tellers. And then they ended up hiring more people to support the ATMs. So now you have a dedicated ATM person who empties out the ATM, works with the ATM, resolves issues. Maybe multiple people actually working with that ATM when you don't actually need that if you don't have the ATM to service like one or two people versus all the people that are still waiting in line at the bank. So it's kind of ironic actually how that has come around. But that's one technology where the banking system, although it's a convenience, it costs them a lot of money. And it actually makes a situation where they have to charge fees because of the cost and the overhead of that system. And what are they getting from it? Nothing. Headache and nightmares. So then they started closing down ATM locations, and now they put up satellite branches. Actually, Wells Fargo did a lot of this stuff. They, they got rid of the ATM, and they just put a branch there. So now you see a branch in a supermarket, or you see a branch in a convenience center, or in a shopping mall. Actually, uh, Mercado's got or a couple of the big malls around here. They have so satellite branches. You walk in, you can talk to a customer, or you can use the ATM. You know, you're still going to have the ATM, but it was more effective. Also, time lags. Time lags with technology. Time lags with processing. Uh, benefits do not always occur in the same time that IS is implemented. So, you put something in and you measure the results, which is actually what happened with the ATMs. They're now paying for themselves. Initially, they weren't paying for themselves. Which, and if you measured it that year, you'd say, oh no, that's not good at all. That's going to be, you know, we should just, and if you pulled them out too early, then you'd realize you weren't going to benefit from it at all essentially because you know you didn't wait long enough to experience the benefit of the technology that you put in so this happens a lot in engineering and unfortunately the big pitfall is okay well we'll just wait a little bit longer uh, the product development isn't going the way we want it to go but we think it's going to turn around soon and then two years goes by and it's like well why didn't we cancel this a year ago or two years ago and the people are like well we didn't know so how did you not know because the flip side of that is, you know, if you gave it time, it might have actually been successful, but it's a risk. So balancing the risk, balancing the time, systems integrated with existing systems, they take a while to actually see the benefits. Um, also redistribution. So IS may be redistributed. So the pieces of the, the pie rather than the big picture could be separated out. Increase in market share comes from expense of uh, competitors and competitors market share in terms of the redistribution so long story short resellers packagers you make a why nobody actually buys wireless technology <laughs> wireless technology is incorporated in, into almost every product now they actually have these really cool phones out that have the internet not phones uh, watches that have the internet on them um, so you don't even have to carry a phone you just carry a watch so I'm waiting for the watches to have a uh, cell phone connectivity as well so that I can answer, you know, hello, how are you, you know, and talk, or actually just better yet, just plug a Bluetooth thing into the watch, you know, why carry a phone around with you, so, and then it could also store like, you know, plug it into your computer and check your email messages wherever you are, kind of thing, maybe, so, anyway, that's my dream product, so, I think it, there's actually prototypes of this product on the market, so, huh, Google, oh, something launched last week, Samsung, yep, 
I don't really have to go to take a look at it because I'm going to be the first one on the market to have one of those. Right, the first one in the public, probably. I don't know. I've been waiting for that product for years because I don't like to carry a phone. I don't even wear a watch because I, I, I have a computer. So if I don't have a computer, I don't have a phone, I can wear a watch, have the time, have my, self, have my text messaging and my email and everything with me along with the ability of someone to reach me. And have it like run so like constantly, so I don't have to put a battery in there, so I don't even have to like charge it at the end of the day. Yeah. That'd be like the perfect product. But that's redistributing pieces of the pie rather than making uh, the pie bigger, separating the components out, making other products from stuff that's already there. We also have mismanagement that occurs. Bad business model cannot be overcome by good information systems. So you have a bad, poorly running company. You are running a retail store. And uh, people have to wait in line forever, and your sales are down, and things are happening, and th things aren't working out right. Well, then you buy a bunch of POS equipment so that your tellers are faster, and, or your, your retail salespeople are faster, and they can process each one of the sales at a much faster rate. And then you realize you're not making any money still. <laughs> that, because it's not really the people that are out there, it's the cost of your inventory, or it's the pricing system, or maybe it's even the location. So you have a bad business and you're trying to fix it with technology. That's the reason why a lot of the dot coms went dot bust, was because they didn't have a good product concept. You don't have a good product concept, you don't have a good business model, you don't have a good business plan. It doesn't really matter how much of a web presence you have, not going to work. It's like selling tires online. When it costs you more to ship those tires than it would just to buy them at a local store or pet food for that matter. You know, it doesn't work out that well. But did they really think about the business model before they opened up the doors? No. So they figured, oh, it's the internet. You can sell anything on the internet. And then a lot of these companies kind of sprung up out of nowhere. Look, grocery store. Look, pet food. Look, tires. Look this, look that. Everything was out on the internet. And it's like, well, these are really bad business models. You can't fix it just because it's now done with e-commerce. E-commerce wasn't the solution. So nor is it going to be a solution in the future for another business that's trying to fix themselves through technology. So managing a successful business case, looking at the difficulties to quantify it, the money doesn't grow on trees, so you've got a cost-benefit analysis, it, and you need to make strong business a case for faith, fear, facts, these are things you're going to back up your decision with. So making a business case for information systems in terms of um, the faith, the fear, the facts, eh, or anything you might want to put in there. you got to justify a cost-benefit analysis. So arguments based on faith, build it, they will come, you know, which is essentially the argument. Uh, organizational strategies, competitive advantages, industrial forces, customer expectations, example, Procter & Gamble. They built their entire company on faith. You think, well, that's not a good way to build a company. You know how many products this company has, though? They just keep adding more products to their product mix. They still add more products to the product mix. So they're one of the biggest companies out there for consumer products. They sell everything from baby aspirin to Q-tips to bigger stuff, you know, appliances and things. Procter & Gamble's really huge. They just built it, and the people came. <laughs> Do people have a market for this? No. How many other people sell Q-tips? Tons of people sell that. So they just had a knack for figuring out what consumers wanted, and they have a pricing structure that meets that. So it's, it's actually fairly decent, and they have fairly good quality products. So Arguments based on fear. If we don't sell that product, we don't get into that industry, we're not going to survive, which is the common thinking. So we're basing everything on the notion that the system, if it's not implemented, the company is going to lose to its competitors, and it's going to go out of business. Well, automotive industry does that. So automotive industry, with this recent thing on hybrid cars and green vehicles and all the other stuff, if we don't have a hybrid, well, actually the government said, if you don't have one by this year, you're not going to be in business anymore. So, oh, well, that's kind of a harsh reality, but it's true. Long story short, they're driven by fear, <laughs> fear of compliance and fear of government regulation. Well, that's how this university actually runs. It's by fear. We have international students, and we want to make sure Sevis doesn't attack us, or Sevis doesn't come over and close us or something. So we're in the fear of being compliant constantly. That's why we have attendance people come in to take attendance. And we have all these regulations and all these rules that nobody likes to do. 
you know, like you have to be here and you have to do this, and you have to do that. Well, that's fear because if we don't do it, we're going to lose our licensing and you guys are going to be deported and sent to another country. <laughs> <laughs> we're not anywhere near close to that. But if you think back a couple of years ago, there was a lot of schools out in California, a couple of them in this area, that had that happen to them. So, And some of them are reopened, actually. But I guarantee it, they're living and basing all their decisions off of fear. <laughs> fear of closure again. Uh, also focusing on investment decisions in terms of facts. So fear, faith, facts. Facts are going to be considering when... Uh, when to present a good argument that's based on fear versus when. If you have facts, maybe it's not fear. If you have a, you know, in here, looking at this diagram, you have the industry factors, technology factors, business strategies, information systems, investments, and all of the different pieces that would go together for the organizational performance. And you're going to base it on whatever components lead you into terms of the right direction for whatever organizational performance measure you're looking at. So working backwards, I don't have to cover this because we already covered this. We've got Porter's Five Forces model. So this one, and mostly at this point in the course, people are wondering, what do I need to know for this final exam? You will have some questions on Porter's Five Forces model. This is the third or fourth time I've actually brought it up in the lecture. It's in every one of the beginning lectures in all of the lecture series, so be familiar with this model. I went over this model already. I'm going to kind of skip through it, but it's also in this lecture. This is lecture number three of the Management of Information Systems Innovation. Because what I'll have you do is I'll probably apply the model to a scenario. So the way that the exam is going to work for this class is going to be, this is for the final exam, it's going to be an essay format. I did this in the last term and it worked out quite well. So I'm going to give you like 15 questions and you pick five that you like. And one of them will be on uh, Porter's Five Forces. So you'll be able to decide, what do I know? What do I don't know? <laughs> so this is one of the choices. It's always going to be one of the choices. Um, and so looking at the framework and understanding and being able to apply it to a business, small little business scenario. So the questions are more like mini case studies, but not really that lengthy. And you'll write a couple paragraphs to answer the question, depending upon what the question is and you'll be able to provide hopefully some insights um, from your background. And you're wondering, well, what's the correct answer to these questions? It depends on what you're saying. So the reason why I like the essay format versus the multiple choice is because you don't have to memorize and regurgitate. Instead, you're going to use your background from your perspective, whether it be technical or business, and come up with something to say about if you're going to say applying Porter's uh, Five Forces model to a retail store scenario that you're given. What are some of the things that um, are of interest in terms of, apply the framework, what, what are some of the things that you could possibly do to improve the quality of something or to make the business more profitable? Um, and looking at, okay, well, these are the five factors, you know, the bargaining power of suppliers. Maybe uh, the company's not getting the best pricing. Maybe they need to do a little bit more sourcing on their products or their inventory. Or maybe it's the threat of substitute products or services and maybe the company's not spending enough time improving and innovating their current product so that other people are going to come in and easily produce a, a likable, you know, similar product at the lower cost or something. And that would be actually a cost thing, bargaining power of the buyer. Can they buy your product somewhere else cheaper and does it have more features and is it a better product? You're not going to be in business for very long. Um, working with the threat of new entrants or rivalry among existing firms and stuff. So I mean, those are things that you could possibly apply. To look at the arguments based on fact, and then you're looking at the data. You're doing a quantitative analysis, disruptable factors, things that are part of the environment. So in terms of the primary tools you're going to do, this is where you're, if you're a business person and you've studied business, accounting, finance, um, some of the models out there. You can do cost-benefit analysis. You can identify costs, identify benefits, contrast them, weigh and multi-criteria analysis, do a bunch of stuff. So, In terms of cost-benefit analysis, identifying and weighing the cost of the ownership. So total cost of ownership, which is the acquisition, the cost, and the maintenance. Which is actually kind of interesting because people don't do this in their own personal lives and then they wonder, so, well, maybe I should have thought about that. You buy this really, really nice car 
that's made by this brand new company that came out of nowhere but it's cheap but the company's brand new this is day, day woo and then the company goes broke and then you realize if you bought that cheap car that came from this company that came out of nowhere and then it breaks down it's going to cost you more to fix it than it would be just to buy a brand new car. This has actually happened with Daewoo, actually. And then the company goes away. They don't sell cars anymore. So who's going to support my vehicle? Nobody. It's like, well, then it's nice that you got a good price on it because you're going to need to sell it now. <laughs> and then nobody wants to buy it. So you can't even sell the car. This is about five years ago. You can't even sell the car because the car is not worth anything because it can't be fixed. Nobody's got parts for this. Nobody's going to service it. You know, that's the total cost of ownership. You know, it's more expensive to own that car than it would be just to spend a little bit more money and buy a different car from a different company, you know. And then people go, oh, you know, actually, people argue and they do the opposite. They say, well, I'm going to buy a Mercedes or I'm going to buy a BMW. You know? Why? Because I can get, or actually, Honda is the car. Honda is the best value on the market. According to the last consumer reports that I looked at, uh, Hondas will get two or 300,000 miles on them. Pay a little bit more for it in the front. But the repair costs are low, so the total cost of ownership is less because you can keep the car for several more years than any other car in this comparable price range. So the cost of ownership, well, you have to do that with business decisions for information technology services, processes. You know, so if we buy this thing, what's the cost of this thing? Well, people found this out with printers. Actually, you get this with 3D printing, too. You can buy a 3D printer pretty cheap now, about $2,000. Cost of ownership, not worth it. The materials cost to actually do the printing, the software connectivity that you actually have to do, the training that you need on it, send it out, have somebody else print it. <laughs> not worth it. The equipment itself is pretty cheap. The Getting the knowledge, getting the worker, getting the CAD program to work with it, getting the drawing, and then getting the material the plastics or the whatever it is you need to produce out of this printer, not so cost effective. <laughs> Cheaper just to do it, you know, just to have somebody else do it for you and not own the equipment. Uh, cost of acquisition, use, maintenance. Maintenance is actually kind of an interesting one too. Uh, we had the same problem with hybrid cars. It's gone down, but the first uh, set of hybrids, I won't mention the company. Um, it costs eight thousand dollars for the battery. The battery would need to be replaced every two years. Wow. Do you really want to own that vehicle? <laughs> no. <laughs> Not longer the case. Now the battery gets replaced every five years, and it costs you five thousand dollars or four thousand dollars. They cut the hat. They cut the cost of it in half, and it's every five years now. It's a battery-run hybrid vehicle. Still on the market. Still has that expensive battery replacement cost, but it's not as bad as it used to be. Who in the world would buy that thing? Nobody would buy that thing. Nobody did. Actually, well, some people did. Recurring, uh, non-recurring costs. Well, it's actually, you know, think about it. It's kind of like the Teslas. This is not Tesla that had the battery problem. But think of the Teslas are like $100,000 for the Tesla. And you're going to save $2,000 a year in gas. <laughs> so if you had the car for 12 months, you know, and you're thinking, well, it's only a... You know, not that much money. Does it really warrant a car that costs you three times as much as any other car on the market? But people like it because it's a status symbol. Look, I can afford a $100,000 car. If I'm going to buy a $100,000 car, I'm not going to buy a Tesla. <laughs> okay. I'm going to buy, like, you know, some nice convertible Mercedes or something. I'm not going to buy a Tesla. <laughs> but people do it. Actually, ITU owns two of them, I think. <laughs> or one of them. I don't know. <laughs> Why do we own a Tesla? Don't know. Don't know how it contributes to education or the quality of education or how that works in with our business model here. We can save maybe a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars a year. The car never gets driven. That that's the no brainer there. I'm like, well, you're gonna buy a hybrid, you're not gonna drive it. You're gonna drive other cars that cost more money? But why'd you buy this thing? Anyway, I think it's to impress customers or something. I don't know, know why they bought it. Anyway, cost-benefit analysis is what I'm talking about. Identifying the benefits. Tangible benefits, a 5% increase in sales, a reduction in order entry errors. Intangible benefits, improvement in customer service, improvement in the overall perception of the firm. In terms of the cost-benefit analysis, oh, this thing is blinking. I don't know if it's still working. So, Oh, yeah, it's still working. I think that you can't hear me back there. Oh. Some people can. 
I'm trying to make an effort to make my, my, my voice project. So, oh, we have attendance? Good, because then I can check on my, my mic. Okay, we're back. I'm going to try and finish this lecture today. All right, so cost-benefit analysis, another technique that can be used. Uh, we can actually look at the break-even point or the net present value analysis, identifying the value of uh, maybe perhaps some future cash flows that might come out of this if we're going to do this investment, or the total cost of tangible benefits. There's many different ways of doing this. We can do a weighted multi-criteria analysis where we look at um, a method for deciding between different alternatives. Hey, you just missed attendance. <laughs> oh, well. Anyway, uh, between alternative investments or alternatives between the same system with different types of implementations. So you can do a lot of work um, in your management capacity to analyze the effectiveness or the potential effectiveness of different system implementations and different timings of the systems. And then you will eventually be presenting the business case and persuading the decision makers in your firm to buy in on your decision. So knowing the audience, knowing and identifying the stakeholders in the group, also a good point. If you're pitching your investment to something, you're, you have this investment idea, we need to go wireless throughout the entire organization, and you're pitching it to the janitor, you're not necessarily going to get any results out of that. Hopefully you won't be pitching it to the janitor, but you never know actually when you get into management who really makes the decisions. So you got to find the decision maker, find the person who's actually going to um, actually take some action on this, and then you can get your, uh, get your ideas uh, implemented, hopefully, if it's a good idea and if the management agrees with you. So a long time, I mean, a lot of people spend a lot of time complaining to people or pre 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 presenting ideas to people and they go nowhere. Generally, it's because they're t presenting it to the wrong person. And it may not necessarily be, you know, the same person all the time. It might be a different person for a different thing as well. So converting the benefits to a mon in monetary terms, looking at the benefits of the new system, saving an example, one hour of, of work per day for a you know, for 12 mid-level managers or something. Um, in this particular case, you can quantify how much work it's going to solve and what it's going to do. So, In a perfect world. Who's that? Oh, somebody's phone. <laughs> okay, I, hear, I keep hearing these random noises. All right, we can also devise uh, proxy variables and put, make a scenario out of it. Here's a clear cut. When clear cut estimates are not necessarily possible, as an example, you're going to put in a new technology to automate somebody's job to do something um, faster. How are you going to know when this job never existed before? What it used to take? How much time it would take manually? So you put in these estimates and these, you know, these uh, sample environments to essentially assess the potential benefit, if there is a potential benefit. And then you're working off an approximation when we don't necessarily have the assessment available. It's not really possible. Also measuring what is important to management as well. Maybe management doesn't really care how fast employees are working or what it is that they're actually producing. Maybe they're more interested in the company image or something. Or maybe they're more interested in the connections or the green, you know, the green ability or something of the company. And that doesn't really, you know, they don't really care about what it is you're trying to improve. So bottom line, you want to improve something that is of importance as well. And then measuring that importance, the case becomes more meaningful to management as well. Um, so assessing the IS infrastructure, presenting a holistic view of it, the economic view, holistic meaning an overall encompassing view of it, economic view, architectural view of it, operational view of it, regulatory, compliance, values. There's so many different angles. You can't just say, oh, this is going to save the company money. You know, what does that mean? You know, there's so many different perspectives and so many different views that you should bring into it for justification as well. well. All right, looking at how companies can continuously look for innovative ways for information system from competitive advantages. In the last section of this lecture, I believe I'm actually going to make it through the day rid of this lecture, get it off our plates. Valuing, valuing the innovations. So a new technology will make or break your business. So we have to basically take a look at, you know, what is the value from a Moore's Law perspective or from a Murphy's Law perspective or from whatever management technology or science you're going to apply to this. Looking at, <clears throat> in terms of the valuation, trying to put a, a value on it. It may not be dollar value. 
it might be a sense of um, company um, respect or company knownness or something. It might actually put your company on the map, which has a dollar value to it. So it's not always necessarily dollar value. Successful innovation is difficult. It's often fleeting. It's also risky. And the choices are often difficult to make as well. It's not following what your competitors are doing or following modern technology trends. You might not necessarily want to do that. Example would be the Blu-ray versus the HD uh, DVDs that are on the market. Blu-ray is not so popular. don't know why it's even still on the market. Um, some of you guys might actually own Blu-ray players. They're very popular in the, in the retail outlet places, but not so popular in industry, which is kind of interesting. I don't know if I'd run out. I don't even own one. I wouldn't know if I'd run out and get one. Uh, it's like, well, you guys remember LaserDisc? LaserDisc was a huge, before the DVDs came out, people spent so much money on laser displayers and layers. I still have some LaserDisc. After that experience, and then you can't buy a laser displayer anymore, nor can you buy LaserDiscs anymore. So, I mean, you know, actually, you could argue the same thing with those 8-track tapes. The 8-track tapes were along for a very long time before the CD came around. So... All right, so innovation could be risky. Sometimes uh, even superior products can lose the race, depending upon their price margin, stuff like that. Uh, foreseeing the future is not always possible as well. In 1994, the Internet was not given very much attention. Actually, it wasn't. Actually, back when I was in high school and uh, actually back when I was in college, people didn't have any faith at all. The Internet, no one's going to use it. Why, why even bother? Don't take Internet classes. Like, and the internet wasn't very popular. In fact, computer science wasn't really popular back then either. It was just like, you know, why are you studying this? You know, what, you know, oh, because there's no jobs in it. You know, why are you doing this? But now all the jobs are internet related and all customer related. So the economy changes, things change. So, which is actually kind of interesting because you never know what's going to be popular in the future. Which is actually kind of funny because what ended up happening is when the dot bust happened and all those internet companies went out of business because they, they weren't really solid companies. A lot of students, you know, ran away from computer science and software engineering and they went into business. Now we have a shortage, so we don't have enough graduates in computer science and software engineering. So now the hottest career right now and all the enrollments are going up in computer science and software engineering. Why? Because it's going to cycle again. <laughs> We're going to have too many of these graduates and then people get out of that degree and then get into something else. So, anyway, my advice is study what you like. It's not necessarily the market that's going to determine your not gonna really going to determine what you like and what you don't like and what's popular now may not be popular in five years from now and vice versa so looking at process requirements resource requirements risk tolerant requirements also another consideration as well in valuing information systems and innovations um, you know do you need to implement change is there a need to it at all actually and uh, will the company implement and do whatever is possible to implement the change given the new technology that you're going to give them which is actually kind of interesting. Um, you know, that little, and one of these technologies I think is just totally wasted is because consumers don't use it. How many people use those, those hashtags? You know, you go over to a retail store with your phone and you're going to like swipe your phone over a sign that has some discount. I don't think people in this room are going to be like frown looks and stuff. It's like, how much money was wasted on that? It's like, no one's going to do that. I mean, people don't do that. Uh, but retailers are saying, oh, that's the best thing since barcode scanning. You know, customers can now get discounts and check information about products and services by scanning their phone. Or I don't know, it's not called a hashtag. It's called something else. I um, can't remember what these things are called. Little boxes. What are they called? Q codes. Q codes? Q codes? Yeah, it's square box. Yeah, I don't even carry a phone with me, so it's totally <laughs> lost on me. But a Q code, do you, do you use those things with your phone? Yeah. Are you a customer? I don't know how many people use it. Maybe a lot of people do. Who knows? I think a lot of kids probably do it. I don't know. But uh, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Wouldn't I just look at the product, read the product? Why would I need that on my phone? It, it is important when you have uh, some relative information, some uh, company information. Ah, company information. Maybe you go to a trade show or something. If you have a, a visiting card and you have Q-Code, yeah? you, you will get your brochures. Ah. Hmm. Not for the product information. Okay. It's very small, synchronized, uh, or uh, it's very limited design. Yeah. With retail people. But it does have a purpose, it looks like. Yeah. Your, your uh, visiting card gets like, converted into digital. Yes. Hmm. 
predicting the next big thing. <laughs> so, actually, your comments probably lead into this. Maybe it's the next big thing. Who knows? Uh, but yeah, those little cue card things were. Yeah. Uh, apparently, there's a purpose for them, and apparently, there's a need for it. Uh, so, deciding on which innovations to adopt is very difficult as well. If you're a retail company, are you going to adopt that technology? Are you going to work with it? Are you going to grow with it? Or are you going to adopt something else? So diffusion of innovations, the classical view of adoption and innovation looks like this. We've got the innovators, we've got the majority of the people, and then we've got the laggards. People that, I'm right here when it comes to those cue card things. I don't know. But this is people who are like late, I call these late adopters. We have the early adopters, we have the mid, and we have the late adopters. And this is not you in general, this is you over time with new technologies. Some people will be in this group, and then they'll be in this group or that group depending upon what it is. Now, if it was, we're talking about a notebook computer, I was like right here. <laughs> we're talking about cue card technology. I haven't even looked at it yet. <laughs> I'm like way down here at the end of this late laggers. Uh, and so, you know, you basically figure out where your innovation fits into this scenario. And then your biggest group is going to be in the majority. They're going to be the mid, the mid technology people. Yeah, you got some innovators here. So these are the people that would pay like $1,000 for an iPhone the first time it came out. I think they were $899, actually. These are the people that paid $900 for that iPhone. This is everybody right now who's got an iPhone with them. So, And uh, this is over here. Once the iPhone is, these are the people who are buying the iPhone 5 when the 6 is out, or the 4, or the... Because the, I think they're giving the fours and the fives away. I don't think you can get a four anymore. I think they're giving the fives away now with free plans or something. I don't know. Uh, but they're not going for the current one. Those are the laggards. They're going to go for the cheap deals. They wouldn't own it if it wasn't an old product. So, Innovator's Dilemma. Disruptive innovations. Yes, we have disruptive technology. That's actually kind of um, disruptive technology and disruptive innovations is really a... Uh, hot topic these days in the media. As you think about it, what does this mean? New technology products and services that eventually surpass dominant technologies. So the cell phone was disruptive because now we don't have landlines anymore. Nobody uses the landline. So wireless, disruptive, because now we don't use wired technology anymore. So if you think about it that way. Uh, notebook computer versus desktop computer perhaps, disruptive. Changes the way people are doing something. People aren't going to go back to the old way of doing something. So, ah, internet TV versus radio broadcast. We don't even have broadcast anymore in some areas. So it was disruptive. Cable was disruptive. Internet access is disruptive. So when you start thinking about it, isn't modern technology disruptive? <laughs> well, then you go, well, disruptive is not necessarily a negative word. It disturbs the economy, per creates a shift in products and services and the way that people go about doing their job and living their life. It is disruptive, but it's not negative. It's an improvement for the most part. So we haven't hit a point where it's become negative for the most part. I mean, people would argue and say, yeah, you know, technology makes people dumb and less productive and yada yada, but yeah, they still like it. They still own the, the products and the services. So. Online versus brick and mortar retailing, automobiles versus horses, CDs versus records, MP3, MP3s versus CDs. Can you still buy CDs? I think you can. Are there still record stores? There's, do they still sell vinyl records? No. I'm pretty sure they do. Because DJs use the vinyl players and stuff. People still use CDs. Although a lot of DJs are using MP3s now on computers. They just hook the computer up and they just play it from there. So. That's disruptive technologies and innovations. Undermines effective management practices sometimes. The trends here from the 1970s to the mid and high performance users were the bulk of the market. Then we had DEC that tried to, to sell to those markets and then now we have the microcomputers that are seen as toys actually. So that's kind of the evolution of the computer market in terms of destructive tendencies from low, medium, and high performance network users. So that's kind of like uh, how small companies are now selling to big company markets. Actually, we're going to see, uh, just the other night I saw a, a TV commercial that was actually kind of disturbing. And they're trying to put down, it's Microsoft trying to compete with Google now on the Gmail product. Because 
Everybody knows Gmail. They sell your stuff all over the place. They market. You know, you're you're being you're being you're, there's no privacy with your email. <laughs> you're being marketed to. You're they're using your your data, your stats, and everything. And people don't like that. They don't like the privacy invasion, the invasion of privacy. So now Microsoft's trying to do that. So now Microsoft's trying to take over with their new product, with their new Outlook products, and then Outlook email, the whole Google market. Which is kind of disruptive if you think about it, because now we just all got accustomed to Gmail. The entire world's on Gmail, so now we're gonna what switch? Everyone's gonna switch. We'll see how that works. Actually, if you haven't, uh, they just started launching these local television show, television commercials. Actually, I'm not switching yet, <laughs> so because I'm a late adopter, so I'm not gonna switch anyway. But um, I don't know. Microsoft seems to think that they're gonna come in and disrupt the entire market and get all the Gmail people to go to Microsoft. So. Which would be interesting, actually. So here's another one, a growing performance of computers. And yeah, the, the slide set uses the computer market and bigger computer or server companies selling to smaller markets and consumers and things. So not as uh, I'm a 3G and 4G service, actually. So the innovator solution here, we have the disruptive growth engine as a model. And it helps organizations respond to innovations more effectively. So they start early. They ex have executive leadership that follows through to buy in to launching of these products. They build teams and they educate the organization about what the product is doing, which is actually kind of funny. You go to some of the bleeding technology companies, the ones that are like producing like state of the art technology, and you come in, you ask somebody, they have no idea. People that work at the company have no idea what the company's making, <laughs> which is actually kind of interesting. Maybe that's a good thing they don't know what the company's doing. Uh, and then they figure out later on, what, they, what, what product are we producing? What are we doing? And then they figure it out and they go, oh, hmm. Which is kind of clueless when you think about it. if you educated the organization, you got everybody's buy-in from a team perspective and also a management perspective, then I think it'd probably be more successful in the long run. Customer service people would be able to help the consumer better you know, things would actually go faster if people were educated on what the products and services were. So in terms of implementing the innovative process, there's a process to innovation that you have to think about. The e-business um, innovation cycle, the key to success and extent of the ISUs for timely and innovative ways. The cycle going into choosing, matching, executing, and assessing. So there's a cycle that goes along with the innovative process planning and the execution of the innovation. You just don't come in Monday morning and replace all the systems and say, hey, now we're this company and this is what we're doing now. There's like a cycle that goes through it and you can spend a lot of time analyzing and coming up with the cycle. This is an example of one organizational cycle and this is all the organizational learning that's leading into the external market in the assessment of that. Um, you're going to definitely have different models and different cycles for whatever it is that you're looking at in terms of your company technology. So here's the e-business innovation cycle as an example. Choosing enabling emerging technologies, processing devoted to looking at emerging IT, technology focused essentially. It may not necessarily be technology, it might be systems related focus or another type of innovation. So most about 90% of our innovation today is definitely technology driven. So, Because technology has been the driving factor for like the last 50, 60 years or so for American business. So, uh, for every business, or every country's business. So matching uh, te uh, technologies to opportunities in the innovation, making sure that you know you can follow through with all the different steps. I'm going to kind of skip through this because we don't really need to dwell on that too much. So thinks of uh, three ways to think about investments in disruptive innovations, putting technology ahead of the strategy. Technology is so important to success. It needs to be considered for a strategy to develop afterwards. Uh, some people that would argue with that disagree. Say, no, nah, you should have a strategy. A strategy, then you should have a technology that drives that strategy. The strategy you might not actually, the, the problem with that is you might not actually know the strategy until you put the technology in. So example of the package carriers or package handlers and the GPS or the the wireless tracking of packages and the updating in the manual not the manual the automatic way of customers scheduling packages and stuff well if you can automate it and the technology drives it so that it can be done instantly 
then customers can request a truck to come by their house and pick up the package because you know which trucks are in the area. If a truck is around the block, you can send him by your house, pick up, and actually they do this for free. You know, you have to schedule it in there though. And you're lucky if it actually shows up within the same kind of time frame that you're looking at. But then they can introduce those products and services. Yeah, free pickup. Schedule a pickup. It's like, oh, it's like, who in the world would ever think you'd be able to schedule a pickup with a strategy that has better customer service? I don't have to get my car and I don't have to go running over town looking for a drop box to put this package in or store to put this in. I can just have the guy swing by my house and pick it up. <laughs> it's like, wow, okay. But the strategy of that wasn't, they didn't think we need to have people go buy houses and pick up packages. They weren't thinking that way. They were thinking, well, they're in the neighborhood. They're next to the house. Why can't they just pick it up? You know, so the strategy was after the technology instead of before it. So that's how a lot of the innovation is actually working now. Putting the technology ahead of the marketing. That's a funny thing, too. Rapid development of technology makes it possible for people to know what they want before they actually get it or have it. So you put the strategy out there before you start marketing it out to the public. When you start marketing it to the public, you already have the audience. So it's you don't have to market it. You don't have to sell it before you do it. You do it with the assumption that you're going to be able to sell it. And you already have your market share by the time you actually start marketing it. So the innovation happened first and the marketing happened second. Which is really what's going on today. I mean, you don't actually have to sell a new version of anything <laughs> if you're a good company. You just stick it out there, people will buy it. So, and it's kind of wishful thinking for the most part, but it works in some cases. Uh, innovation is continuous as well. You just can't stop in your innovation. So that's like companies like Apple. They're constantly coming out with uh, different products and things. I wasn't really too happy with the i the latest iPhone. Who cares about the colors? You know? I'm not really a fan of the, I, I shouldn't say this while I'm recording, but the uh, I'm not really a fan of the, of the iOS 7 either. I'm, I'm starting to grow on me a little bit, but I wasn't a fan of it when I first installed it. But they're trying to be innovative, and they're, they're actually looking more like Microsoft, actually. Um, this, uh, iOS 7 reminds me of a Microsoft interface. It's all text. There's no more buttons and GUIs. And it's all text-based stuff. Anyway, free economics. Uh, leveraging the digital technologies with the free goods and services to customers as a business strategy for gaining competitive advantage. And here is a, how our free economics works for Yahoo. The price is set by the products and service margin, and the margins for digital services decreases tremendously, and then we can set Yahoo that makes millions with free email services by placing ads. So the free economy is kind of like the Google. Google makes... Google ads, Yahoo, you have ads, you have advertising. Yahoo actually is a little bit different because they send the ads with the emails, with the interface that actually gets the email. Gmail is less evasive in terms of pushing advertisement for you, but you get ads. Ads show up in your email, ads show up all over the place. And people buy ad space and time so that they show up in search results and they show up. Basically, you have Add click ads and stuff. So value proposition, someone somewhere is paying for the service. Eh, yeah. So Gmail is free to people who use it, like you guys, or consumers. But somebody's paying for that service that you're getting for free. That's the catch. <laughs> so in the beginning of the, you know, the big internet hype, people went, how come Google's free? And Gmail is free, and Yahoo is free. Yeah, now they're making money. They're making a profit. How are they doing? Well, they're providing a free service, but they're selling ad space and they're selling the data. Google's selling your data. You're so they're doing data mining on you. Uh, they're selling this. They're selling. There's profit in it for the company. It's just not being paid by the consumers. Being paid by the businesses that are supporting it. Which is an interesting approach. It gives you something for free. In turn, there's a price to pay for that freedom. <laughs> so, Approaches for applying free, and this is what's referred to as free economics. It's free. Yeah, no. Uh, well, to some. So advertising, free, you know, free minimum, costs, subsi subsi across subsidiaries, zero marginal costs, labor exchange, gift economy. It's kind of like the old uh, freeware kind of thing. 
shareware, freeware. Well, so freeware and shareware are two different things in open source. That's totally different concepts. Whether you're getting something for free or whether or not you're getting something to try out, then you're going to buy it. Actually, that's the um, uh, Netflix does the free economics. You can do, which is actually kind of weird because they turned into a free economics. It used to be just a paid for service, and then you got a free. You know, free three days, or excuse me, 30 days or 90 days. And then now you have to buy per DVDs in the mail or for internet. You have two accounts now instead of one. They're actually making a lot of money with that. <laughs> so, and then uh, they'll, but they'll give it to you for free in the beginning and then you sign up for it after you get hooked on it. Uh, versus the uh, Amazon Prime that'll sell you, you know, a year at a time and you try it out and you go, oh, well, I don't really use it that much. Too bad you can't cancel it. You already paid for a year. <laughs> Actually, Netflix has got games too. They do like three or four months at a time. They'll charge you up front, so you don't have to like get charged to every month. But you've already paid for three months. So you're gonna wait three months and remember to cancel it then? Maybe not. Maybe so. The pricing strategy and the whole free component of it makes money for them in the long run. So. All right, so opening case here, these are some interesting case studies that were out of the book to conclude this lecture. We're managing the digital world in terms of TiVo and staying ahead of their competition. They were actually one of the first products that did this whole DVR thing. Uh, most people know that for that. And it was automatic recording and uh, pausing a show. And then we had RSS feeds that came around and also watching YouTube videos on TV and uh, programming TiVo from your cell phone. So, and not using TiVo at all, using another, like a Roku or something else, another product that does it for you. Or not recording, just watching on demand whenever you want to watch something without having to record. So the product evolved. TiVo's still in business, though. TiVo is still around. Uh, they've changed their product mark, their mix a little bit. Now they have more of a, you know, mobile. They're more of a Chromecast product. They have a Chromecast kind of interface where you can cast Communicate your TiVo safe stuff, content to other devices and things without having to like keep it attached to one device. Uh, IT department often knows what people want and what, what's happening with people with large companies. Discovering senior executives has uh, visited pornography, pornography websites and stuff like that and knowing that, well, maybe we should cut their access or maybe we should block certain sites and then strategies for ethical decisions and stuff like that. Rootkits, Sony Secret, they don't do this anymore, but for a while they were doing rootkits for copy protecting CDs and stuff. Actually, Apple did the same thing with iTunes for a while. No longer. They took all that stuff off. The DRM. Um, so, anyway, kind of skip through that. There's just some case study scenarios at the end. What I wanted to do is actually kind of move forward. Spend a couple more minutes here. This one was, uh, this one I think was the end of. Uh, Oops, this is the wrong one. It was the end of that lecture, which was the MIT like MISI lecture, which was number three, actually. So what I want to do is kind of start this one with the, uh, you know, I'll finish it next week kind of thing. But I want to just show you something in here that was a little bit different. There's a little bit of overlap with this lecture as well. This one is uh, management information technology, not the information systems, but the information technology lecture three, which is what we're supposed to be on this week. Um, but the good thing is we've actually already covered most of the beginning part of it because it's looking at again Porter's model but this one also defines and if you're looking for information if you want a textbook this is a good good lecture to actually read through defines information systems defines information resources and information technology and all the different facets of all of these different components that I keep talking about and innovation as well but the concept of this information resource is actually kind of interesting because it's now a company asset. It's like intellectual property now for the organization. And there's value in the resources. So it's not IT, it's not IS, it's not even I it's not even information, it's a resource. So it's a component. It's not a mailing list, but it's data and know-how. So it goes into that knowledge discovery concept and knowledge. So it's information that's gained, housed and translated into data that's used as information for a resource. So if you look at the definition, it's intellectual asset hierarchy. So we have the data, the information, the business intelligence, and the knowledge. 
So the data is the raw facts and figures. The information is what's derived from it, from an information systems perspective. The whole thing turns into a resource. Which the resource is knowing what your customer age category is. How old are your customers? Uh, what nationality are they? Um, where do they come from? Um, when you know when when uh, when do they shop for your products? When are your business times? Where are your business times? What products do they want? Because the better that you know your customer, the better business intelligence that you have. So there's a whole big now trend towards BI or business intelligence on the market. So collective information. So it might be about your customers. It might be about your competitors, your business partners, your competition, your environment itself. If you have the business intelligence, then you can save a lot of time and resources with your marketing and with your research to come up with strategies that actually work with, less fa with fewer failures. Because one thing about businesses and strategies and trying to implement something is that one out of ten ideas actually work, or two out of ten. A very low percentage of good ideas actually come out of a lot of strategic planning and a lot of testing. Because if we did, there wouldn't be a such thing as competition. I mean, if all ideas were good and everybody's idea worked 100% of the time, we wouldn't, have no, we wouldn't have a business environment that we would have right now with no competition and stuff. So people put out failure products, they put out failure ideas and stuff. Stuff that just doesn't sell, you know, happens all the time. And uh, the way that people have discovered recently in businesses is to look at this as business intelligence and become more intelligent and from a business perspective, then you have more better, you have better decisions that are coming out of this. So you make fewer mistakes. If you minimize your amount of mistakes, knowing you're still going to make mistakes, but you minimize the amount of mistakes, then you make more money in the end. So we can still put out bad products, but we're not going to put out as many bad products in terms of the philosophy. Some people looking at me going, oh, I thought, you know, businesses, they don't put out bad products. Yeah, they do. Every business puts out a bad product. It just happens. <laughs> All right, so business as an information resource, gaining business intelligence, what we're really then looking at is knowledge. So it's knowledge discovery. Broad term, describes many different things. Contextual explanation of business intelligence. Actions to take to affect business intelligence. Intelligent assets as patents and trademarks and things fit in this category. Organizational know-how for things such as best practices. And I uh, hope this thing turned off. Hmm, okay. Uh, in terms of quality attributes, it could raise the quality for the timelessness. Timeless, timelessness when you need it, describing the right time period. When uh, in terms of a, as a quality attribute, the best information is no longer good when the scenario is over with. It's great that we knew the customers wanted this, but we should have had this information last year or something. Uh, so timeliness, location, no matter where you are, the business intelligence should be effective. The form, audio, video, animated text, validity. You want your business intelligence to be correct. So if you're getting your business intelligence from surveys or from um, third parties that are saying, hey, this is what our customers want, there might not be as much credibility. Actually, surveys are not very credible these days. You'd think they would be. Uh, most people would actually do like focus groups and stuff versus customer surveys, especially when you put a dollar value on completing the survey or some reward for completing a survey. A lot of people just, okay, give me the reward. Here. They're not really giving you good data, so the data is really not that good. A lack of the above can create a garbage in, garbage out scenario. Using a bad survey results and saying, oh, our customers, they want this. No, they don't. They just want the Best Buy free gift card. <laughs> they don't necessarily want this. They're just saying this because. So, In terms of the organizational perspective, we can use information systems throughout the processes within the organization, excuse me, the resources themselves. The current state of the organization as it fluctuates for different levels, the strategies, the goals, directives, working with the functional business units, the work teams, the third parties, the enterprise, the people that are working with the organization, and then uh, information gran uh, granularity, you know, whether or not you're getting summary reports or you're getting the day-to-day -day sales works, and this is the, the hierarchy of labor within the organization. So this is customer suppliers and other programs working in and out with the management levels. This is being the CEO, this is being the tactical workers on the bottom. 
So long story short, all of the factors change for the information resources needed at the different layers, different levels, along with the frequency of the data, how coarse or fine-tuned it is, and you know, basically giving into how functional the organization is going to be, or how functional the data is going to be, and the resources are going to be within the different levels. So, all right, I'm going to end at this pyramid right here today. So, um, because this is a good stopping point, because what I want to do is kind of get into the bottom-up, top-down approaches and the different organizational structure approaches, which leads into information resources being used to better equip the company to make better decisions to gain that business intelligence. So the next kind of, which we finished the Porter's models, we finished competitive strategies, we finished innovations. The next kind of topic for this course is business intelligence and knowledge discovery, and then using knowledge workers to make uh, more uh, well to, to make more productive employees, but also to make a better better business structure and organizational structure. So that's a good stopping point. So someone remind me next time next week that we stopped on MIT dash lecture three, and then uh, I gave you guys an overview of the assignments from last time, right? So we're now hitting the midpoint of this course, actually. This is like week seven or so, or eight. I mean, we're almost halfway through. The, we're almost at the midpoint. Do we have a midterm in this course? No. Did I have it put it? Well, I guess my bigger question is, did I put it in here? Or is it still not in here? Let's see. It is in here. Perfect. All right, so I guess... Um, we are sort of hitting the midterm. We still got a couple more weeks before the midterm actually happens. So what I'll do next week is go over the midterm, and then you can start working on that. The due date for everything is in December, but you don't want to wait till December. So you want to be doing you know, the first two or three assignments, the first couple. Of, there's only four case studies, I believe. Working on, uh, let's say, for example, uh, yeah, if I look at the assignments, there's only three assignments. Those are pretty easy. The first two of them you probably could be doing at this point and then maybe the first two case studies actually is where you should be at and then in another couple weeks you'll do the midterm and then you'll finish up with the last assignment and the last two case studies and that would be a good good pace to be on for completing the assignments it's not that much work really so and then uh, going through on your own and researching topics and uh, you know you'll need to do that actually for the assignments you don't actually have to do that for the case studies you can base your entire opinion off of the information that's in the case. You can do very much outside reading. But in, depending upon your background, you might actually have to do a little bit of research on your own to get up to speed on certain concepts or certain things that you might be asked to, to comment on in the assignments. So, Do we have any questions about the assignments or the case studies? Or the mid, well, the midterm, we'll go over that next week. Nope, then we're done for today. So I'll see.